So, uh, I know everyone has seen the announcement. Uh, I just want to thank Grudiva, IBM Portugal, that uh, offered us this possibility, and the Portuguese Macmahon Society for bringing us the connection, and the Fundação para Computação Científica Nacional that is uh, transmitting uh, the, in, um, digital diffusion the, this talk. As you know, Gregory Scheitin is a professional mathematician working in computer science. And I don't think it's necessary any presentation, so just uh, the title. I'm an amateur mathematician. I do it straight oh, you are for love. <laughs> again, I'm lucky that right. IBM pays me in addition. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be back in a Latin country. I'm from Buenos Aires, so it's always a relief to be in a place where one can take too long to have lunch. Um, I'd like to talk to you about some crazy ideas. I only like crazy ideas, right? The other ones are not as interesting. And what I'd like to talk to you is um, about um, if, if this were a theory that was already accepted, it would not be a crazy idea. So I'm going to talk to you about something which isn't accepted, which makes it interesting, and it's digital philosophy or digital physics. And what is this crazy idea? I'm, I'm going to, I emphasize the mathematical side, but this comes from physics in a way. Well, remember Pythagoras? Pythagoras, Greece 200 years ago, has this idea, you know, everything is number, God is a mathematician, right? So 2,000 years later, finally a small change is being suggested by the people who believe in digital philosophy and digital physics, and the new version is, everything is software, God is a programmer. And and this new world, you know, the Pythagoreans thought number, they meant one, two, three, four, five. And they were very shocked with the square root of two, which is not a rational number. Well, so these, these new Pythagoreans, the Neo-Pythagoreans, the Neo-Pythagoreans, they think everything is zero and one. Everything is information. So to summarize it, the universe is built out of zeros and ones. And the universe is a giant computer, and everything is zeros and ones. This is the new Pythagore Pythagore Pythagorean theory. And let me, let me give you another example of this. Are, who, are, are we mostly mathematicians here, physicists? Mathematicians, good. Remember, remember Kronecker? Remember Kronecker who said God created the integers, all the rest is the work of man? He was an extremist. Well, the new version would be God created zero, one, everything else is the work of man. So this is a more extreme version, but, you know, it's not such a new idea. I've just discovered a great, a great man called Leibniz, and Leibniz is known for this uh, really lamentable fight with uh, Newton over calculus, but I don't care. Calculus is a little passé from this point of view. You know, it deals with continuity. This new viewpoint deals with the discrete, and, and you can actually find Leibniz talking about zero and one. You know, he's in raptures about zero and one. He discovered binary base two numbers, and there were probably other people who had the similar idea. In fact, Leibniz felt it come from the, came from the I Ching, perhaps, that the Chinese had had the idea a long time ago of binary. Well, anyway, the I Ching is what? You throw 32 things, it gets heads or tails or something, you have 64 possibilities, right? So, but Leibniz really got enthusiastic with zero and one because he said, he said, um, um, God has created everything. God is unity. He was a monotheist. Has created everything out of nothing, you know. Uh, and but what? But Leibniz, the language of Leibniz is old language. But the idea was to get to the logical bedrock of reality, and and this is the same idea that the digital philosophy, digital physics people have. And 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 I read a um, Leibniz was always writing notes to himself, right? He was a consultant running around consulting to princes and everything. And he writes his note to himself about binary arithmetic. And the point is that binary arithmetic is so easy. It's so easy to calculate with uh, zeros and ones only. And he's right. And that's why you use them in the computers that my company and other companies sell. Because zeros and ones are really simpler. So, so and Leibniz, however, envisioned in some funny way the combinatorial potential of zero and one. In a sense, I feel that he sensed CDs and DVDs and uh, PCs, you know, where everything is zeros and ones. You know, he sensed that you could represent anything with zeros and ones. Because not only you can get numbers using base two, but Leibniz was also looking at giving numbers to mathematical assertions. You know, he had this idea of ghetto numbering. 
he had, had this idea of a characteristic universalis, he, the idea of logic, where you would, you would do logic, you would do reasoning by doing arithmetic with numbers for formulas. This was a youthful schoolboy essay of Leibniz. He never had the time to work it out. Leibniz was always throwing out these great suggestions, these great ideas. And, you know, he would write 10 pages a day. So there were something like a million pages of notes that Leibniz left at the end of his life. And the way it works with Leibniz is he usually didn't have time to develop the details, except for infinitesimal calculus. He developed a fair amount. And then what happened? Then what happens is you invent a new field, maybe mathematical logic, Bertrand Russell, or algorithmic information theory in my case. Then you have the misfortune of going back to Leibniz and discovering that he really states the idea very clearly 300 years ago. You know? But you have to invent the field first to discover that Leibniz did it. And, and so I don't want to get involved in the controversy with Newton about Leibniz, but let's go on to some other subject. Oh, by the way, there's this remark of Kronecker's also about Lindenum's proof that pi is transcendental. You know, everybody wanted to show that pi is transcendental. This comes from Leibniz. Leibniz called a transcendental method, uh, a method which was beyond the power of the ancient Greeks. And he was very proud of this formula for pi over 4. Pi over 4 equals, what is it, 1 minus one-third plus one-fifth minus one-seventh. Did I get it right? Yeah. And so there were other people who also came up with this probably, but Leibniz came up with this formula, and he was delighted because he said transcendental methods, which this is, can achieve what the ancient Greeks couldn't achieve, which is the quadrature of the circle, because you want to construct a, a square which has the same area as a circle. And you can't do it with the traditional methods, but with with these transcendental methods, you can. So, so anyway, um, and then Lindemann finally proves that you can't do pi as the solution of an algebraic equation. Difficult proof. And Kronecker says, well, of what use is your beautiful proof because pi doesn't exist? So, so what I'd like to talk to you about is, is uh, because, because Kronecker said only the integers exist, right? So I, you know, he was like Pythagoras. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. But before uh, talking to you against real numbers from a mathematical point of view, is there a clock here? Well, somebody will tell me to shut up probably at some point. I want to talk to you about why real numbers are bad from a physical point of view. OK, so there's these two questions. And so from a mathematical point of view, from a physical point of view, what are some arguments against real numbers? Well, there are lots of them. For example, have you ever asked yourself about the energy in the electromagnetic field around a point electron, y you know, using Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism? If an electron is really a mathematical point, it's a singularity, and you do the integral, unfortunately, it gives infinity, the energy in an electromagnetic field, if the electron is a point. So Poincaré tried to make a theory of electrons as a ball, you know, instead of a point. But then you get other problems, because, of course, you have this enormous charge in this little ball, and the ball wants to split open, right, by repulsion. So these were called Poincaré stresses. And this is part of the reason that Poincaré doesn't get the credit for relativity theory, even though he did it before Einstein, because it got very confused with the question of uh, a theory for the electron, and the theory for the electron didn't work. You know, he was trying to understand electrons. Well, anyway, since you had somebody here talking about the speed of light two weeks ago, uh, why shouldn't I also say that, uh, you know, relativity theory was invented by Poincaré, even though... He even used the word. Okay, so let me tell you about some other reasons that physics suggests that, um, that real numbers don't exist. Even though I agree that Newton did a nice job using Leibniz's infinite 